To me, that's one of the most important questions in any situation. Lord, what is it you want to be for me now that you couldn't be at any other time? So I often tell the story of um, uh, meeting a woman. I'm late for a meeting. I'm meeting a woman in the corridor, and I'm supposed to be chairing this meeting, and I'm five minutes late. And as I'm walking down the corridor, I look at her, and I get this sense of impending doom that she's going to ask me a question, and it's going to make me more late. And then I have to think, okay, what's more important right now me chairing this meeting or this woman who has an urgent question, because I can see it written in her face. Sure enough, she stops right in the middle of the corridor, no hope of getting by her, you know. So, so she says to me, you're a prophet, right? And I said, so it has been rumored. And she said, well, I've got cancer. It's inoperable. I've got months to live. What's the word of the Lord? So not just your average question then. <laughs> and I said to her, honey, I don't do births, marriages, or deaths. And right now, I don't know whether this is your time or whether God wants to heal you. I don't have any sense right now that I'm part of that, you know. So I said, but I know a brilliant question that will get you an amazing answer. And she said, what is it? I said, you ask the Lord, what is it you want to be for me now that I've got cancer? What is it you want to be for me? It's really, he's either going to heal you or he's going to help you have a brilliant death. Those are the options, right? So ask the Lord this question, what is it you want to be for me now that I've got cancer, that you couldn't be at any other time? I said, you know my phone number, we're in the church, you know, call me up. And she calls me almost every day. He hasn't said anything. I said, it's okay. I said, you need to rejoice, don't put pressure on yourself. Don't put pressure on yourself to hear. You know, the pressure is on God to speak. Right? So the onus is on God to speak, not on you to hear. Now, if you rejoice, you'll hear. If you're panicking and fearful, you probably won't. Yeah? So you need to rejoice that God is with you right now. And you need to ask Him, Lord, what is it you want to be for me right now? So she calls me up on like the third day, fourth day, sixth day, eighth day. He's not said anything. Well, if he doesn't speak initially, he always speaks eventually. Here's the thing. Stop putting pressure on yourself to hear. The pressure is on the Lord to speak. He takes the initiative. Therefore, he has to speak. You know, what you're doing is rejoicing puts you in a place where you can hear. So... 11th day, 12th day, he's not said anything, he will speak. Just keep asking, the, it's a good question, he'll answer it. So on the 17th day, she's in the grocery store, walking down an aisle with a shopping cart, and a woman with two kids comes around the bottom end, and she recognizes she used to speak to that woman in junior high. And so they're like getting reacquainted, got two kids and all that kind of stuff, and and as they're talking, there's a, I think it's like a six, eight-year-old girl. He's tugging on her mom's dress saying, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. Said, not now, darling. I'm talking. And, you know, a few minutes, Mommy, Mommy. Not now, sweetie. We're talking. Don't be rude. Mommy, Mommy. What is it? That's the lady I saw in the dream. Here's the thing. 16 days before, which is the day after she started asking this question, 16 days before, this child has a dream and goes to heaven in her dream and she sat in Jesus' office, you know, like you do. <laughs> so she sat in Jesus' office talking to him and on his desk, there is a framed photograph of this woman. And so she asked him the question, Jesus, who's that person? And he said, oh, that's a lady that I want you to meet when you wake up. And she said, why do you want me to meet her? Because I want you to give her a message. And he gave her a folded piece of paper, like about two inches square, and he put it in her hand, and he said, I want you to give her that message when you see her. 
as she wakes up in the morning with a folded piece of paper in her hand. And then she's at the grocery store and suddenly she sees the woman. Mommy, that's the woman. And so she tells her the dream and she gives, gives her the piece of paper. And the question is, what is it you want to be for me now? And when she opens the piece of paper, it says, I am the Lord that heals you. So here's the thing. Now the more logical of us could have said, well, why couldn't he have just told her that himself? <laughs> but here's the thing that we all have to understand is that God loves weaving stories around stories. And he never does anything one-dimensionally. He does everything multi-dimensionally. It's like right now in your life, he's got probably four or five things that he's doing in your life. What we do, because we're church people, is we put all those five things in one space and we think that God is doing one thing, but it's just like too big for us to cope with. But in the kingdom, we understand multiplicity. That God is doing five things. What that means is, he, he wants to have five relationships with you in your life right now, not just one. So you have five things going on because God wants five relationships. Here's the thing though. What if each of those situations has fullness attached to it? That means you're going to get five times more full. Right? Come on, you've got to see this the way that he, he is an expansionist thinker. He's extravagant to the max. He won't just do one thing. He, wa he likes to do five or six things in your life. And he likes to separate them out because he wants to have a relationship with you right here in this thing so you understand the gift of God and the fullness that's yours. And then he'll want to have another relationship with you here. That's why we have to journal. So in each of those things, he wants you to take them individually and learn the individual joy that's yours in each one of them. What does the enemy want to do? He wants to put them all in one place so he can overwhelm you with worry. God says, no. What if the Father wants to be something for you in this one, but Jesus wants to be something for you in this one, and the Holy Spirit wants to be something for you in that one. Come on, that sounds like fun. That sounds amazing. And what if they've all got promises, so you get five promises at least. Knowing God, though, you might get ten. Yeah? And then sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit will wander into Jesus' story because he's got a promise he wants to give as well. Because they're all in collusion together. They love each other. They like acting independently. They love acting together. Come on, at least allow for the possibility. All things are possible. You notice God leaves that totally open and doesn't explain it. Because he doesn't want to explain it. Because that would ruin your experience. Because if he explained it, you'd narrow everything down to the explanation. Some things he likes to keep as a mystery because then it's like, you know, well, it could be all kinds of things. And we develop a sense of wonder in mystery that we lose when we feel, when we just have one single explanation about something. Yeah? Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. So every day is about receiving something from God. Know the gift of God. So you've got six things going on. What if you're supposed to have six gifts? What if you're supposed to have six promises at least? Come on, don't you want to pull those situations apart now? And think, okay, I'm going to have a journal about this one. I'm going to have a journal about that one. And I'm just going to explore all these different things. And I'm going to thoroughly enjoy being a new person. So what if all those six situations are about you becoming six times the new man that you were before they all occurred? What if doing six things at once is God's way of giving you continuous shortcuts? 
He's got a lot. If you want to live to be like at least three score years and ten, he's got a lot to cram in if you're going to be like him. Yeah? He's got a lot of stuff to give you before you pop your clogs and go to heaven. 